digitaljamsessions.com. Hello and welcome to this Digital Jam Session. Today we're going to finish the session with Laura from E1, Lance Weiler from Columbia University and Andrew from The Difference Engine. Previously we discussed immersive entertainment looking at film and cinema. We continue the conversation looking at theatrical live experiential experiences. But I, I do have a question, and uh, Andrew, this is probably one for you because you know you, you do the live theatre. Um, but the one thing I do notice is, is for example, with with the likes of uh, Generation of Z or, or you know Zombie Weekend or any of these you know kind of live um, theatrical immersive experiences, what we tend to find is is that that when you go through that process and you come out the other end drenched in blood and, and what have you, um, there does tend to be a unique bond that has been formed with your fellow audience members. In, in a way that, that you know, is, is very different from any other kind of experience that you might have gone through together. It's, it's very much a, you know, kind of a, a mini going through the trenches experience and you come out the other end of that with a certain sense of bonding and a certain sense of fellowship with those, those uh, you know, people who, who were in the same group as you. And, and what that has led to is, is this emergence of, of what one might even call kind of, a, you know, the beginnings of a movement, if you like. Um, that, that once people have been through this experience, they, they want to re-engage with the experience again, but not necessarily to actually experience the theatre, but to be on the other side of that. So, for example, you know, signing up to become a zombie and to be part of the theatre group, if you like, um, as a volunteer. And this is actually how certain you know, businesses like Generation Z or, or you know, um, Zombie Week Weekend actually continue to thrive is by having this ongoing movement of people willing to come down um, and, and actually give their time willingly as a volunteer to help sustain the show. And that's everything from volunteering to be a, a zombie to, through to, you know, makeup departments and, and having, you know, makeup students volunteering to do the makeup. Um, and I, I'm curious as to whether or not you have seen that same sentiment with things like The Heist where there is that, that sense of unification almost with the audience, that they're, they're looking for, almost, um, that thing that they want to follow through with, that, that, that communication that they want to, to take that next step further beyond the experience. Oh, very, very definitely. And, you know, we, we deliberately build in decompression. So we, we compress you slowly into the world and we decompress you out. Uh, and because also the shows that we make, uh, failure is possible in the outcomes that can happen. What you went in there, you might not achieve. Um, there's a there's a kind of a post mortem that happens uh, afterwards, or we give you space for that post mortem to uh, to occur with the other members of your group. And typically, we we work in you know audience groups of five to sort of five to fifteen people. So it's a it's a reasonable conversation that can take place, um, and 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 it is very eager, and that's actually driven by the audience normally. Um, but the they kind of have their own decompression where they work out what happened. They exchange information about kind of what ha how they got away with certain bits because they get separated at various points. You know, the, the, it, it's also collaborative because they're all pulling towards the same goal. So it's not about the kind of uniqueness of the the kind of interactions. It's about how they achieved whatever they achieved mm -hmm. in their show, uh, and they get to talk about that. We also have elements within our shows where they. Um, we can have elements of the audience maybe uh, screw over the other elements of the audience. Uh, we, we like to encourage kind of a certain amount of tensions uh, within the audience as well, uh, as well as being kind of about teamwork. Um, so, you know, that's an incredibly important part of our experience because mm -hmm. that's when you kind of really get to think about the experience that you've gone through. Um, now, when it comes to taking that a step further, uh, we're working at the moment within quite a strict framework that we've set for ourselves. Um, in terms of business model, uh, a lot of the ways that have kind of supported a lot of companies at the moment uh, have been around volunteer work. And that, you know, that works for some people. Basically, we, we as a company made a decision very, very early on that we were not going to accept voluntary work in that kind of a way which for a, for a live experience is quite difficult because um, where, where you lack the, the money to necessarily build a, a realistic environment in lots of ways, the easiest way to flesh it out is with people uh, and bodies. Um, uh, and but ideally informed bodies who well, <laughs> you know what exactly. they're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean performers really is what I'm talking about. We looked at that and we had a, a real soul searching kind of a time. We basically decided that that's not going to be something that we pursue. Um, because 
we felt uncomfortable uh, with the idea that what should be a successful business model is being underpinned by people working for free. Not, not because those people don't want to work for free, because they definitely do. Uh, and, and we've said no to lots and lots of people who wanted to get involved. Uh, but because of what the knock-on effects that are for the creative economy in general. Now, I'm, I'm an academic by background and a, a data scientist, uh, so I'm very analytical about these things, and we reached a, a, a kind of a hard and fast policy about it because of uh, our own views. But the framework that we've kind of come up with is that if you're there to see the show, or if you're there to participate in the experience, you're there to be part of it, that possibly on the night, there are ways in which you can take that, uh, that kind of uh, knowledge, that kind of aspect, and get involved in a way that is different, so that not all members of the audience are necessarily equal. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to really kind of uh, get into the, the, I suppose, what, what the gaming industry refers to as replayability. Because um, mm -hmm. we had people who turned up to our uh, heist and our recent Battlefield Live experience um, with uh we, we had people try and turn up like seven or eight times and they were they were then being a destructive influence on their group because they knew too much but that's in a successful show that's going to happen and you want that to happen so you want to enable that and you want to en allow people to get involved and and to share their passion and to keep on keep on going with the world because really you know we're trying to create a world which people believe is pervasive is there even when they've left and that the changes that they've made to it are kind of immutable throughout time. So we want them to believe that and we want them to still kind of have that feeling and passion that it's still there. Um, so we're trying to create ways in which people can potentially get involved in a, in a more sophisticated way if they already have a certain amount of experience within it. But it's a really difficult line to tread. Uh, and we're, we're definitely struggling with it at the moment. I'm, I'm sure other people have had much more success. Um, but we're, we're, it, it comes from a, a decision which is based from a perspective of, okay, we're in London. I'm surrounded by struggling artists all the time. Uh, very, very creative, very, very talented people who are struggling to make a living. And if I felt like I was giving somebody a, a job or or allowing somebody to do something for free that I would otherwise have to pay someone to do, then that is a slightly, that's a slightly difficult decision for us to make. So we've decided not to make that decision. And th that's a, a really mm -hmm. reasonable stance to take on it, actually, and and one that uh, you know, I think shows a certain degree of of um, consult, you know, solidarity, if you like, with with the creative community, and it, it firmly places you within the creative community. Um, and I wonder then if perhaps this, this notion of kind of easy leverage of the audience by using things like volunteering is perhaps, it, it is an outcome certainly of, of an interaction or an event of this nature, but it, it isn't necessarily the right kind of interaction. And how do we take people beyond that initial experience to to fulfill and sustain this world beyond their initial experience. And, and I'm, I'm curious, um, certainly Laura, from your standpoint, yeah. you know, when we talk about the, these massive immersive worlds and, 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 you know, from your perspective, you're, you're working with worlds like, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming that you're working with Divergent. Am I wrong? Uh, yes, we released Divergent. <laughs> you released Divergent, okay. So much. <laughs> <laughs> Hypo yeah. Hypothetically, um, yeah. you're working with worlds like that. And yes. when you work with a world like that, there are obviously certain places where, you know, obviously theatrical has its place within that, but, but do yeah. you see a, a place for this kind of self-sustaining world beyond the, the, the theatre, beyond what they're seeing on the screen? And, and how do you, you provide a place in yeah. that for the audience to really be able to help sustain it? Yeah, I think you, you can, and what you sort of you know, going back to what we were saying earlier about sort of letting an audience make things their own and taking their own experience. So there is a uh, sort of Oculus Rift um, experience we have as part of the marketing diver for Divergent that people can enjoy, but then it still, it still is within a level of control from the filmmakers and from the distributors and from the digital agencies who create all the sort of the games and the world online. So they, they're giving the audience the tools to kind of create 
um, their own stories and, and to make it their own. But it, it's very much sort of, there's still, you know, obviously that divide between the filmmakers and the distributors and the audience. And I think that exists, you know, throughout all film at the moment, if that makes sense. Do you think it's, it's a gap that can, be, that can be removed? Do you think it is something that should be removed? Um, I don't know, because I think, and same, so say you're, you're looking at theatres, going back to what Andrew was saying, sort of using that example, so you have the, the people who create the show and who are involved in the show, and they're providing the audience with the experience that they then, you know, it's a sort of live action show that they, they enjoy and, and they take, they're very involved and they take part, but there, there's still that sort of, um, there's still not, it's not so much a gap that there's still creators and audience there, if that makes sense. And it, it is the same with film. And I think in order to maybe have the, obviously in theatre it's very different, but in film to have the, the idea that creates the fans, that gets people interested, you need to have those creators there in the first place. And then you can let the audience kind of roll with it. And I think that there should definitely be more uh, freedom for audiences to create from that point onwards. You know, when you hear about... Um, you know, some companies getting annoyed because fans are taking the story and writing their own material online. You've got, you know, you should let that happen because it's, it's the audience kind of building back into the world. But it's still, you know, once the sort of original idea has got to a certain point. But if you're sort of saying, do you want the audience in from kind of a very early stage in the actual kind of creative process, especially in film with its sort of traditional narrative, you know, it's sort of them, um, would you create something that would, would then be able to build fans? because it's too um, sort of uh, fractionalised at that point. And I yeah. tend, tend to agree that, that if you don't have enough substance there, then there's very little for them to latch yes. onto in the first place. So I think audiences should be able to sort of create and involve, but, you know, audiences in, you know, I'm sort of talking particularly in film, they're drawn to a film that they like, a story that they like, characters that they like, and there's, all, there's always sort of a sort of initial creation there to start with before that world can grow. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, we've, we've talked a lot about live action here and we've talked about kind of theatre as, as an immersive kind of um, format. But obviously, you know, we've mentioned it a couple of times now, um, things like the Oculus Rift and, and talking about devices and, and technology, I think, is, is um, an interesting, uh, you know, next step in terms of immersive entertainment, because, you know, entertainment isn't all necessarily just about film. Um, or even games for that matter. But I am curious to, to, to hear, um, certainly from Lance's perspective, um, what do you think is going to be the next big piece of technology that is going to shift the way that we, we perceive immersive entertainment? Well, I think one of the challenges that immersive entertainment has is the, the scaling issue. You know, like how do you scale that experience? And so one of the areas that I think is, is really fascinating is uh, is the Internet of Things. And the reason that we're exploring that with Sherlock Holmes is, um, you know, by the end of this year, there'll be 1.5 trillion sensors in the world, um, which really means that we're, you know, uh, everything is rapidly becoming connected to a network, um, you know, from automobiles to uh, everyday appliances to things that, you know, just we touch in our lives. And so I think that that provides a really interesting opportunity to weave story over the real world. Um, in ways that were not possible previously. And I think it, it, it creates this opportunity to bridge in a way that we haven't been able to do yet on the digital side. You know, like when you read that, you know, Portis Head has had 35 or million views and a uh, million listens of their streams on something, uh, streaming networks and only pulled in, you know, um, you know less than 2,000 pounds. Um, you start to see how digital is very difficult in terms of monetizing it. But uh, the reason that I'm kind of bullish on the Internet of Things is it brings an analog tactile element back. And then if you can connect that to the cloud in an interesting way, I think you can start to, um, you can start to do things with story that have never been possible before. Uh, we did something. I collaborated with uh, TIFF and the CFC and David Cronenberg on a project called uh, Body Mind Change. And I was brought in to kind of design uh, a connective tissue for that project that went between a retrospective of David's work and a traveling exhibition that will travel for four years all over the world. Um, and uh, I was asked to kind of make it global and local. And I was asked to do an adaptation around David's work. Um, and so I came up with a storyline, and this is fictional, that 
David had taken the, the science and the technology from his films and he had licensed them to a biotech startup and that that biotech startup was using that core technology or that IP as a way to develop a series of next generation human implants, you know, with the goal of evolving humanity. And when you would go through that experience, it had three simulations that were based upon emotional intelligence. So the first one was really about uh, uh, trust and disgust. The second one was about fear and anger. And the last was about joy and sadness. And it had a Flowers of Algernon kind of arc where the artificial intelligence that you were interacting with went from being a naive child to becoming a rowdy teenager to, be, to realizing that it was never going to become a human. And within that experience, if you went through the three simulations, and it told you this up front, that um, you were kind of giving birth to what was called pod, which was kind of like something from uh, extents, uh, you know, where it was like this biological um, kind of um, thing that you could connect to the back of your neck, and it was called pod, and it was personal on demand. It was a play on quantified self and uh, this idea of uh, personal, you know, recommendation engines, and it knew what you needed, wanted, or desired before you did. And if you went through the experience, as you were going through, we were capturing a variety of data points within it, uh, you know, what people watched, how they responded, where they clicked on screen, how they interacted with it. And in the museum space, for anybody who made it through all three simulations, a 3D printer would fire up and we wrote an algorithm that would create a pod. And so if I played or you played or somebody else played, all our pods would be different. And it was creating a significant narrative object. Now what ended up happening was people flew in from all over the world to claim this little hunk of plastic, but they were connected to it in a way that they had never been before. And it had come out of a story and a play-based experience. And so I think the internet of things is really interesting because I think it gives us a chance as creators to be able to do something that has a tactile companion, but can continually evolve due to a connection to a network. And so I think that that's an interesting, an interesting space. And I could see those objects then interacting with some of the other things that people are really kind of excited about currently, which are, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, and things of, of that that nature. Interesting. I, I I like that you're you're talking about this um, kind of bringing it back almost to physical manifestation of story uh, versus, you know, there's a lot of people who want to focus in on things like, um, you know, digital, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality or cloud. And, and you know, they've lost a, a little bit of that element of, of physicality, I suppose, which is why, in some respects, I, I think there is such a strong visceral reaction from audiences when it comes to live immersive theatre. Um, but having said that, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Laura, to hear your point of view in terms of what you think are the key technological or, or device uh, trends that you think will make a significant difference further down the line in terms of immersive entertainment. I think the, just the change um, is so rapid in terms of the devices that are coming out and what people view, um, sort of view their entertainment on, be it a game, uh, be it a film, be it TV, is, is kind of rapidly changing and people watch programs and films across their various devices and as lifestyles change that changes how people consume entertainment as well and i think really that's you know it's always started the big you know shift in film just with you know people don't watch sort of dvds so much anymore and it's all sort of move on to vod so it's those kind of slow changes that are, i mean the technology is kind of rapidly increasing but it's it's the ind industry and the kind of content creators that aren't kind of keeping up with it at the moment in a sense, but I think that will start sort of moving, um, moving at a quick, quicker pace and people will start sort of designing content for the different apps and for the way that people are consuming content. But I think to look at something, you know, say things sort of something big like the Oculus Rift, um, at the moment, my experience with that is people using it for, for gaming and in, in film it's been used for games that are really a kind of marketing tool for the films and uh, yeah I don't know to what extent or how quickly that will for example kind of change change film. I tend to agree with you in as much as at the moment I think the use of the Oculus Rift tends to be very much about kind of um, flagship kind of uh, flashy moments rather than necessarily something yeah. that is uh, adding or, or enhancing uh, aspects of the story itself. Yeah. It's much more about people using it and then I, I sort of for marketing and publicity so that, you know, the sort of audience members who, who have used an experience 
uh, be it at an event or some of these experiences are kind of traveling around. It's then that they talk about it and they tweet about it and they blog about it on social media, which all brings it back to kind of driving people into the cinemas. Mm -hmm. So it's still being used as a marketing device rather than something kind of integral to film. And I'm sure, you know, obviously in games, that's slightly different, but that's, Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I I think even within games, to a certain extent, it's still about the cool factor, not necessarily about the plausibility of of utilising the device for uh, narrative gameplay. Um, But I'm interested to hear your point of view, Andrew, in terms of what you think is going to be the significant change from a device or technology standpoint that will really change the face of immersive theatre for you. It's going to be whatever people take to heart uh, the most, uh, which, you know, be it a I'm really excited about the personalization of devices and uh, some of the kind of uh, location-based capacities that, that exist within them. Uh, there's a slight, well, I'm, I'm slightly concerned at the moment because uh, there's a, a data backlash brewing about people mistrusting uh, these kinds of devices because of the, the data capture um, uncertainties about what's going on. And there's a whole suite of politics around that. Um, But I'm hoping that doesn't happen. And I'm hoping that people then start to engage in a way with the technology that is at their fingertips in the everyday. I think that as an artist that tries to make work as realistic as possible, almost, um, we put technology at the heart of our shows because it's the only way we can run our shows. Uh, It's the only way that we can run our shows. But every time that we do put technology in, it has to be in a way that people are comfortable with and that people want to and intuitively interact with. So the personalization of devices is great because it creates this incredibly intuitive, incredibly uh, recognizable interface, which people, which, which audiences can just get, right? They pick up a device, they get how it's going to help them. It's a, it's a help, it, it, they get how to interact with that. And we can piggyback off the back of that in a huge number of different ways in order to really enhance their experience. But fundamentally, uh, I think there are some really interesting things that are going on in uh, taking immersion to a a kind of a next level thing with the Oculus uh, Oculus and uh, kind of the other immersive virtual reality style things. Um, But I'm, I, I still think that there's a huge amount of store to be plumbed out of technology that's already around. It's just not being deployed in artistic ways in kind of the, the right way. Um, uh, I, it's, I never, it never ceased to amaze me. We put radios in, in our last two shows for audiences to communicate with each other. And they just love it. Like, they just absolutely go nuts. They pick up, they, they completely mess it up and they end up, you know, deprogramming them and, and, and breaking them half the time. But, you know, th- with these little radios, they just love that it, it's something that they've seen, that they get, and that they really intuitively understand how it's going to help them and how it's going to help them in an artistic sense as well. Uh, and and I think there's huge numbers of devices like that and, and technologies like that which which are just going to keep, you know, as we learn how to better deploy them, as they stop being cutting edge but start to become something that we're comfortable with and that we treat as kind of uh, a recognisable kind of almost a family member, right? You know, uh, you, you give an old-fashioned Nokia 210 to somebody and they have a really personal experience <laughs> with it it's it's bizarre but they have a really personal experience mm. with it and and we can still use things like that as well as these cutting edge you know great kind of technologies and and the internet of things is something that i am i'm very much looking forward to when when i can i can basically create a world where devices uh, where the APIs behind some of these devices inherently understand what I'm trying to make them do. At the moment, when I put Raspberry Pis into a piece of technology or a, a backpack or whatever and I have it around, I have to be very, very careful what APIs I use in order to make sure that they can hook into each other. They don't quite understand to do that. how to do that. I'm looking forward to the kind of behind-the-scenes uh, library kind of programming that needs to take place for... Uh, common common kind of uh, common libraries to be developed so that as an artist I can pick up a whole set of technologies and they already interact 
in some of the ways that I want them to. Uh, we're a little way away from that. Uh, but I think that the more people try and use technology in the work, the the better will sort of go go to the, the, the sort of faster will move towards that ideal situation. Indeed, indeed. So guys, I want to thank you all very, very much for taking the time out today to join us on this Digital Jam session. Uh, before we uh, part company, I would like to ask you each to just to shout out for me your Twitter handle or your website or whichever way or form of communication you'd prefer the audience to be able to follow up with you. So uh, starting with Laura. It's just Laura Wilson 04 on Twitter. Okay, and Lance? At uh, Lance Weiler uh, for Twitter. Wonderful. And Angie? Uh, probably best place is uh, at Difference Engine. Uh, only one E in the middle. Thank you for listening to this Digital Jam session and thank you for sticking with us through to episode 10. We're always looking for ways to improve the show, so if you have any feedback, thoughts or ideas about how we can improve or change up the uh, format of the show, then please do give us some feedback and let us know. Remember to subscribe to us at digitaljamsessions.com and we'd love to hear your thoughts about what kind of digital jams you'd like to hear. Thanks again for listening. Digitaljamsessions.com